Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me on this Thursday, October 20th in the Locker Room. I'm Alan Locker. Emmy-nominated actor Michael O'Leary is here to today to talk about his latest role as Dr. Mathis in the number one movie in the country, Halloween Ends. The film is the final installment of director David Gordon Green's reboot trilogy of the John Carpenter horror franchise. Uh, it is in theaters now and streaming on Peacock. As daytime fans, you all know Michael played Dr. Rick Bauer on Guiding Light on and off from 1983 through the end of the series in 2009. Today, he will share his memories of playing everyone's favorite doc and getting to work with Jerry Verdorn on season six of Venice. He currently has a recurring role on Law and Order Organized Crime as father Brendan Hogan and has also appeared in primetime on FBI and New Amsterdam. He's hard at work bringing his play Breathing Under Dirt back to the stage and will update us all on the latest news. Please help me welcome the talented and funny Mr. Michael O'Leary to the locker room. Hey, Michael. <laughs> Congratulations on having the number one movie in the country. I know. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> um, and, and, and as you and I were discussing before we started, I have never seen a Halloween <laughs> I never seen a Halloween movie until I flew out to LA for the premiere. I saw 2018. So, and, and uh, so that was that streaming on the plane. Yes, the 2018, not the not the one. Yeah, 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 ended. yeah. Right. So funny. I mean, it's crazy how long how long that's gone on. Yeah, I I had no idea when I auditioned for it. The um, it was listed as Cave Dwellers, and it wasn't listed as Halloween when I auditioned for it. So, you know, I didn't connect it, and they did that on purpose um, to sort of keep it under under wraps, so to speak. So I, I just thought it was just another movie that I was auditioning for. I had no clue that it was Halloween ends. What was an audition like for Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> well... It was, I mean, for folks, I don't want to spoiler alert, but this doctor is not like Dr. Rick Bauer, not even close. He's a bit of a, a bit of a skeeve bucket. And um, <laughs> so, and I didn't know David Gordon Green. I didn't know this prolific director and all the different things that he was doing. So I was, I was pretty relaxed. And um, the audition was a very skeevy doctor objectifying a young nurse. And so I guess I did it well because I got I, the job. I guess, I guess you did. I don't know what that says about me, but it, it is crazy that you know, <laughs> you 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 do get cast as doctors, doctors and priests. Um, <laughs> so far, I like to break out of that. But listen, you know, if they want to cast me as a doctor or priest, so be it. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, were your daughters excited? You know, Alan. My daughters have been very sort of nonplussed. I mean, even when I was on the show, honestly, I don't know if they ever watched an episode, <laughs> you know? So when I say, hey, got this role in Halloween Ends, I go, that's nice, Daddy. When are you going to come up and see me? I mean, so it's, you know. That's funny, I, though, I don't even know. I was listening to a story where you said um, one of them started crying when they heard Guiding Light was canceled. Yes, my oldest one did, <laughs> you know. Um so, yeah, it, it was like, I don't know, quite frankly, Ellen, if I want my daughters to see this because of, you know, what happens to me in this, because it's not, you know. Yeah. It's not pretty. It's not, not pretty. Not, not pretty. Yeah. Halloween movies usually, you know, what happens to most people in, in, in all of these Halloween movies is not pretty. <laughs> no. There's, there's no love. My love story is very, very short. <laughs> Um, well, you just said you flew out to the premiere and right. you took this lovely, lovely lady as your date. Yes. You know, I mean, you know, could you even, you know, 1983, 2022 go, you know, like, could you even imagine? You know, Ellen, I'm, I'm going to use the word blessed a lot this hour, but how blessed am I and how blessed? Us, we are as a cast that who, mm. here we are all these years later and we have substantial important relationships in our life and I've known Krista since 1983 when we worked on the show um, 
as uh, The Four Musketeers, which I think arguably is one of the best stories ever written. I mean, ever, that I ever was a part of. <clears throat> I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree. I, I, you know, I would almost say it's, I was watching before, but it, it definitely is probably yeah. the one that totally sucked me royally in. Right. So I asked Krista if she would be my guest and she said yes and that obviously you see the beautiful orange dress that she's wearing and we had three days of uh, of a lot of fun it was very it was a whirlwind uh and i'm still recovering from it but it was it was a lot of fun well here you are with some of your cast members right this is the lady on the yeah left. on the left is michelle dawson she plays nurse deb and uh you know just she's got a little bit of an evil eye there too quite frankly <laughs> And uh, there's Krista, and, and on to the right uh, of the screen is her husband. And um, where was the premiere? Oh gosh, it was at the Grauman's Theater. Oh when, wow! Yeah. So, uh, and then in the middle is uh, is uh, is Ron Campbell, the the star of um, the main protagonist in the movie, and he was man, he he's just going to be a major star. He's I think he's in his mid twenties, and he had to step in to people who follow the Halloween franchise. He had to step in what, what I think is a very difficult job, which is to carry a movie that doesn't have a, you know, a, a lot of Mike Myers in it, but it does um, the shape, I guess you would call it. He was just, <clears throat> he was just wonderful. So I, I really, you know, um, for folks out there watching this, I would really uh, recommend you seeing it because there's a real story with this movie. Uh, it's not talked about, you know, slashing and killing. There's a real nice story leading up to the final conclusion. And it really, I mean, you know, you think of um, your longevity on Guiding Light, but like you think of Jamie Lee's, you know, she started that, what, 30 something years ago. Yeah, it, it was. Um, Playing the I mean, same character. Yes. And I met her the first day. Um, uh, of the movie. I think there's a picture there somewhere. I don't know if you have it. Yeah, I forgot. And I apologize. I did have it on social that's media. Okay. Yeah, it's a great picture. Yeah. And as luck would have it, she was for, is very good friends with Susan Pratt who played Claire Ramsey. She is? The show, and she's the godmother. Yeah. She's the godmother to uh, to Susan Pratt's children. So oh, the very yeah. first day of the set, you talk about six degrees of separation, right? I so, had no um, idea. I love that. Yeah. So they're, they're best friends. And so we were sitting on the set the first day we called Susan Pratt while I was sitting there waiting for my scene. And wow. Yeah, great. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. I love it. I have to share what Rachel J said. She said, I'm still laughing about Halloween end. I wasn't enjoying it. The thought about leaving. And then Michael popped up and I was like, okay, I'm here till the end. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of guiding um, lighters have seen it, which I love. A lot of the fans have gone out to see it. I, I'm still shocked at that small world. I mean, the things like that that happen to uh, Susan Pratt and Jamie Lee Curtis. What a random. You know, I knew that. back 40 years ago that they were best friends. Wow. She told me and, and she had just done. Well, let's see, the first Hollywood movie, I think, was in 1978, I think. Right. I'm not sure. Probably around there. Yeah. yeah. I believe I even may have met her for a moment. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just a, a moment, but um, they've been very close friends. They met, um, I think that Susan may have been on one of those early movies that um, Jamie, Jamie Lee was on, and that's how they met. And I might have known that when I interviewed Susan. I just don't remember. Wow, that's crazy. Crazy, crazy. And you stayed with Krista, right? Yes. I was I was wondering where you're going with that. Oh, yes, you know, you um, stayed at her house. I stayed at her house in Santa Monica. Yeah, yeah. she and her husband were kind enough to let me stay there. And I love, um, I love Santa Monica. It was just great. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, breathing under dirt. You've been working how many years now on this? Oh boy, um, it started in March of 2016. And um, uh, yeah, I, I was like six or seven years. Wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, when fans, you know, heard you were going to be here today, so many of them were like, you know, asking if you could bring it to their city. Well, um, 
we're attempting, I've, I've not talked about this very much because I don't like to talk about something until it's meant if we tell it, you know, it's, it's actually going to happen. But, you know, right now we're, um, we're looking at the city of Macon, Georgia, and um, the Georgia. Douglas Theater, which is one of the oldest black founded theaters in the country, is, is going to host us. Um, we have the Macon Arts Alliance as our non-for-profit. The Otis Reading Foundation is behind it. Um, wow. And now we're in a place of um, fundraising with sponsors and to, to bring it down there um, to, uh, to Macon. And um, I mean, the caveat to this too, Alan, is because the place is about, ra- the play is about racial conciliation, healing, you know, I, I want to avail this to the community of Macon, which is still uh, one of the highest poverty rates in the nation. It's, it's one of the most segregated cities in the nation. So I'm really proud of the leadership, <clears throat> the mayor's office, that they want to bring this message about 1954 Macon to Macon. And then afterwards, we have a discussion on race. And uh, which, which is, you know, tremendous amount of bravery on their part to say, you know, we love the play. We want to bring it down here. And now, you know, I'm in the place of uh, fundraising, which is, it doesn't deter me. It's just, you know, it's difficult, but you just, I just, you know, keep that eye on the ball, so to speak. Well, you should, you know, uh, do one of those Indiegogos or something like that. And, yeah, you know, you know I, um, that is definitely a possibility. Um, I think phase one is just to see if I can get support within, you know, the making community. And, um, yeah, sure. you know, these are difficult times. And if I can't do it that way, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that route for sure. Yeah, absolutely. What's it been like sort of, you know, breathing under dirt, but you've been breathing life into this play. I mean, you started it from what I recall and I, I saw it when it was a one act, right? It was a, yes. um, was it still a one? So I saw one act at the small theater on like 42nd or 43rd, but then right. I saw Cynthia do it. What was it? Right. It was longer then, right? Or was it still a Yeah, when you saw there? Cindy do it, um, it was at the Cherry Lane Theater in New York City. Yeah. With and that Bo was a little bit her. of a longer act. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, we, we ended up um, eventually doing it in um, Maryland at the uh, Ella Fitzgerald Theater there. Um, as a, as a, actually, we, we did a little production of a one act. Um, and I, you know, before I go any further on it, I, I have to, to express my deep gratitude to Van Alexander, to Beth Chamberlain, and to Tina Sloan. Because what folks may or may not know, um, I think we'll get to it later on in our interview, but I was going through a difficult time in 2016, and I needed a little victory. <clears throat> And uh, I wrote this little 20 page one act play and my dear friends, you know, availed their time and energy to go to New York and to do this little one act play and it, it ended up winning best play out of 30 plays. So it was my guiding light family that showed up for me. And, um, you know, I'll just never forget. And, and then again, you see this picture with Krista. It's the gift that keeps on giving, you know, <laughs> It really, yeah, it really does. It, it really does. What's your hope, uh, you know, the message that people will take away when they see this play? There are a couple of messages. One is, <clears throat> as I've stated, you know, before that I'm, by the grace of God, in the 12-step program, I, I celebrate 10 years of sobriety in June. That's amazing. Thank you. And it's, you don't, there's no finish line in this. Um, you know, I always... Um, there's no victory. There's no trophy. It's just a day at a time. And, and I, I take it seriously. You don't get cured from this. You have a daily reprieve. So um, that's one part of the play. That, that was the initial message of the play. <clears throat> and then things happen in our world, namely the um, killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, my hometown. And I realized I'm writing a play about Macon. And I need, as a white playwright, to do my due diligence on the Black experience <clears throat> and say to myself, I don't know what I don't know. And I still don't know what I, I think I know. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, we don't. I know. Right. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So um, I spent the last two years researching everything about Macon, Georgia in the 1950s, interviewing Black historians, interviewing uh, the Otis Redding uh, family. And... When they said to me, um, and the artistic director at the make at the uh, uh, 
the Douglas Cedar, when they said to me, um, these characters are perfectly imperfect and emblematic of the black experience in the 1950s, I felt like the play was ready. Um, and I also want to add the, the murder of um, the, uh, the African-American uh, folks that were killed in that Bible study in the church. And I believe mm -hmm. it was in, you know. South, South Carolina. <clears throat> Yeah. <clears throat> so, so Alan, I think, I think what came away is, is when I saw that woman stand in front of the press and say, I forgive this perpetrator who murdered my family. For me, I looked at that and go, how does that happen? That's supernatural, you know? And, you know, I, I'm a man of faith, but that's a faith that goes beyond my understanding. And so I wanted to dive into that and try to understand that and, inter and talk to people and interview people. And so the play, when you saw it, has evolved from this play of just about recovery to about, I think, compelling black characters and this white character in their lives intersecting. Wow. And then going like, and their lives intersecting, how, they're, how they affected each other in the 1950s. So I build up this backstory and <clears throat> I, I'd be remiss not to mention Larry Moss, who's been my director and dramaturg. Um, uh, it's incredible that I have him, you know, Larry's a preeminent director and acting teacher. And, you know, he's been with me ever since from the very beginning, helping me develop the story. And so, uh, when people say, what's it like to write a play? I say, it's like cutting a redwood tree down with a butter knife. It's eventually you're going to do it, but it's painful and it takes a long time. And people go, are you still writing that play? Well, for, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, I, I feel like, um, I've reached the end of it, and now I think it's I'm ready to get up on its feet. It, it's so interesting. I think people really don't realize what playwrights go through and the length of time that a play, the a, a play's uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, inception and and yeah, it's uh, you know the you know the gestation period of yeah. how how long it could really really take, and and a butter knife to cut down. A tree would take a very, very yeah. long time. <laughs> so, but, you know, they say that a play takes four to say eight years to write or, or to, to develop. And, and um, you know, some are able just to, I really admire the people that can just spit out plays and do it really quickly. Um, and, you know, my director said a play is very delicate. You have to be very careful. You can make a wrong turn really quick and lose people. Hmm. So, um I've been very lucky because I've had actors and during COVID, we've been workshopping it via um, uh, Zoom. And so I've been able to really get a lot of work done. And uh, so. Well, we all wish you, we all wish you the best with that. Thank you. Um, I know we've, we've just touched on that 10 years this June. Y you have been, uh, you know, very honest about being an adult child of an alcoholic father and you talk about how writing has helped you forgive him. Can you share that a little with us? I've always been intrigued. I think women are much, much better than, than this than men and this idea of journaling and writing things down on a piece of paper and how cathartic and how healing that is. You know, there, there's that thought up there. And then when it gets to the pen and to the paper, something happens. And so, during the process of, of writing, I didn't know which direction this play was going to go, Alan, but I was in so much pain, so much despair. You know, I was, I was four years sober at the, when I started writing this play and I was still, you know, there was no magic wand in my life. My life was, was very difficult. And that's kind of, you know, there's an old saying in, 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 you know, in, in, the, in the program, you know, when you get in recovery, everything from the back seat comes to the front seat. You know, mm -hmm. the first part of it is, oh, everything's wonderful. And I haven't had a drink. And this is the best Thanksgiving I've ever had. And this is the best Christmas I ever had. And I had all those feelings. But then you have the consequences of what you're, what you're totally oblivious to. But your family's not. Your friends are not. So during a period of time, you find out, the things that you did to the people that you loved and care about. And um, Jill Lurie, my beloved friend and head writer of our, our, our show, 
who's watching right who's, now. Who's watching right now, I said to Jill, because a lot of people will co-sign your nonsense, Alan, mm -hmm. when you're when you're an addict. And I said to Jill, was I could did you notice that I was drinking? Did you know that was a problem? And then Jill said to me, Mikey, you weren't funny, Mikey. You were a very sad, Mikey, and a very sloppy, Mikey. And I was really concerned about you. And I take a deep breath right now because I needed to hear that. I needed to hear a friend say, no, you, you were a hot mess, man, and you needed to get help. So, um, and, I, and I can remember, I call, you know, we call those sober moments when you get called on your nonsense. And Jill, you know, had this very honest talk with me. So um, does that answer the question? It does. You know, it, 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 yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I, I think, you know, everybody can have, you know, drinking. I, I find, you know, it, it is amazing to me that alcohol is um, not restricted besides the age limit. Like, I think it truly is the worst drug. I mean, I, well, I've even had issues where I was unsure whether I was or not. And I remember sort of um, at a period where I just was like, I needed to stop for a while because I didn't want to be 40 years old and go up to somebody and say, right. I'm Alan Locker. And they go, oh, I know. I met you and you don't remember. Right. And I, you know, I was concerned. Um, but having... Yeah somebody who cares enough to say those things is so important. So when anybody listening, if you have anybody in your life and you see them, whether it's drugs, alcohol, you know, any addiction, say something right. because, you know, it could be by saying something, you really could be saving their life. And the other thing, Alan, that we talked about a little bit before we, we started today is um, your, your family members were part of the Holocaust, Yeah. right? So there is a generational thing that you have inherited that you may not experience, but your DNA has that experience. Yeah. You will always be a member of that community. Um, addiction is very much the same way. You know, my, my father was an alcoholic. My mother struggled. All my siblings had their issues. And then if I go another generation, all my father's siblings were alcoholics. And then if I go to my mother's, my grandmother's family, all eight or nine were all alcoholics. It's sort of the Irish curse, so to speak, <laughs> you know? And, and so, you know, it's generational trauma that you inherited. I'm a adult child of an alcoholic. I always will be, as will my children. But you don't have to live in that blame, shame, and guilt anymore. I mean, I'm free of that. I've reconciled with my children. And so, you know, for those who are listening today, I used to hear the adage, you don't have to feel this way anymore. And you don't. You know, I believe before I took the first drink that I was always an alcoholic. And hmm. I had alcoholic thinking. I was always restless and irritable and discontent. I had that before I even picked up the first drink. So is life perfect today? No, of course not. But I have a peace and serenity that I have never had in my life my life. And there's no price tag on that. You know, so what is success? I think success is peace, you know, mm. and, uh, um, and I think so, we all can see that all, all the people who yeah. know you, Mikey, I think people yeah. can see that peace and serenity yeah. and yeah, gratitude. I, and gratitude. Oh, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Alan. You know, um, when I think of my friends, you know, and I go back to Beth Chamberlain and Grant and, and Tina bailing me out of the abyss. I don't know where I would have been if they hadn't showed up. And so sometimes I use the term guardian angels show up for you. You know, and Ron Rains is another one. Ron has been immensely supportive of my recovery, you know, as of, as my the rest of my uh, my family. Uh, Jerry Vidorn, who, who my beloved Jerry, who passed away recently. There is, there's no other community like the Guiding Light community. There's, yeah. There's nothing like it. I mean, how many people stay in touch 40 years later after they've met? Well, you know, and that, oh, you're going to make, I, I'm starting to get tears. 
just because it's it's even not just the cast, Mikey. It's it's the fans. A lot of fans yeah. have met because of what you guys were doing on air. They came together. However, I, either at a fan club gathering, a yeah, mm -hmm. literally, my phone just rang. My phone just rang while we were doing this. I don't know if you heard it. It was my friend Debbie, who I actually met when I was a fan standing outside of Guiding Light Studios in, in 86, when I was eight, 16 years old. It really, it's not just that, but it is something about that show that kept all of you together and, and really kept this community of fans together all these years. Well, here we are. The show is canceled, I think, in August of 2009. And here we are, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, thirteen years later. Years later, <laughs> and the the support of the guiding light community to all of our projects that we're involved in. Um, w when we did the play back in 2016, we had people fly in from Germany and Italy and Texas to go to this little community, this little theater in Maryland, to see the play. I mean, it's and everybody is so gracious and. Um, it, it does, you know, to me, I call them fans, but I feel like, as you said, they're part of our extended family. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I want to just read what Lisa wrote. You know, I was talking about um, if anybody has somebody who, ha you know, you need to say something. Mm -hmm. And Lisa says, suppose someone tells you, leave me, leave me alone. I don't want help. What would you say to that, Mikey? Uh, um. Well, I mean, there's an adage too, is like um, um, the teacher arrives when the student is ready. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but can't make him drink it. Is, is um, you, you can say to him or her, say, I'd like you to talk to somebody. When you say go get help, I don't, I don't know if I would use that verbiage. Right. You know, that's immediately a, a castigate. You're castigating somebody. Everybody's back goes right up. Right. You need help. Like, yeah. Oh, whoa. You know, yeah. not me. My life's perfect. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So I would use different verbiage saying, look, I have somebody else who has a struggle with, um, you know, whatever that is, you know, and, and I think he'd like to talk to you. He or she likes to talk to you. I think that's a more of an uh, invitation than you need mm -hmm. help. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jill just said she wanted Michelle to struggle with alcohol. Michelle Bauer. Oh yeah. That no, I be... think, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. listen, uh, the Bauer family, Ed had a problem and Rick yeah. had a problem. Why not Michelle? Do you know, it's, I gotta say, I'm embarrassed. When I look back at me playing an alcoholic, I did a terrible job. <laughs> I was so removed from that idea that I just, you know, I don't know. I mean, I was an alcoholic when I was playing one and didn't think I was one. You know, it's interesting. We we do these things to remove ourselves from our pain. And, and that's for anybody who's, anybody who's going through these issues, who have family members who are going through these issues. Um, the worst thing about being in that is is isolation. That's that's feeding the beast of whatever that is. And so um one of the things I'm doing right now that I may or may not have shared with you is that I'm a certified um, interventionist and oh. I work with, and I work with families. So um, I, I will, you know, I've had, we'll, people, talk, we'll so. talk about that later. I, yeah, you know. I will keep that, keep that in, in mind. Yeah. I, I yeah. definitely had, um, you know, folks, you know, I had a friend a few years ago, he is sober and doing quite well, but it, it, I can tell you it was, really difficult. He was uh, with my, my best friend who I've been friends with for 40 years. They are no longer sadly together. Right. But, you know, I really thought one day we would find him, uh, you know, not alive because he, he did not, he basically, his, his family after a few times of like in the hospital, he lived in New York. His family was in California. His mother basically said, I want you to come home. So I know you're like alive. Like she was, it was, her, her ruse to get an intervention going basically. Right. And she, she saved his life, you know, by getting him to go to California. Well, the approach that I take is kind of different where you see on TV, where you blindside the person, 
Mm -hmm. I know that <clears throat> addiction is a family disease. So the approach I take is <clears throat> it's invitational. So you invite the person to a family gathering and you take the person from inside the circle and you put them around the circle. So you remove the blame, shame, and guilt. And, and you approach it that everybody in the family has, has a um, responsibility, an issue, a broken place, and you do it together as a family. And the research has shown that one family member equals five clinicians in the recovery process. So the power of family in that process is really powerful. So when I, when I get, when I start studying this model, I go, gosh, I wish my family was a part of this rather than me being removed from my family, you know? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's good, um, good for you. Good for you for doing that. Um, Debbie, who is watching just said, my son is in rehab now for alcohol. Yeah. I think the most important thing when somebody's in an in inpatient, you know, you know, they're safe, you know, they're going to be well taken care of, but the important thing is what happens when they leave. And for me, and um, it's, it's being connected to a 12 step program and sponsorship. And so you just can't leave and go back into the world and think everything's going to be the same. Um, so I would just recommend that when it's their son, right? Is yep. that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Son, yeah. That uh, they're going to get a lot of that. You know, listen, I talk about the 12, everybody has their own journey with it, you know, and I always say, this is, what worked for me. I'm not, I'm not selling. I'm just, this is what worked for me. So I want to be clear on that, you know? And people can see that it has worked, but, but you, you've mentioned you've had help along the way. Do you want to talk about oh, yeah. some of the people you credit for saving your life? I'm going to try not to get emotional about at this part, but um, the very house I'm in, in New York city, um, this gentleman who's a non-denominational minister, um, he, uh, he did my intervention 10 years ago and, um, I was looking for a place in the city and he told me to stay here while he, and unfortunately he was struggling at the time with, um, bladder cancer. Mm -hmm. He passed away two months ago. And, um, so, um, he was like a father figure to me and brother in every way. He saved my life, you know? Um, and he gave me this, it's, it's not, it's, it's very ironic, I guess, that I'm in his home and um, his widow is upstairs. And, um, and so, so uh, you lose a lot of people, you know, um, by fate or in, in, in many cases, they, people die and they can't get sober. And so he said to me, <clears throat> you know, when I was looking for a place, he said, Mike, Mikey, just, you know, come to New York. And I'm, this, I'm looking right now at a beautiful garden. Um, on this patio and you know it's just it's just i just feel blessed you know, i really do people love you mikey you know and that's and and it really is having that support system yeah it is and then you know you you, you have these significant relationships you know um when you go through this process because you can't do recovery by yourself and so i have some very dear friends you know um, that I've gained through this process. And um, your world becomes quite small, but, but really beautiful. You know, I had the disease of not enough isms. I, I had the disease of wanting everybody to be my friend. And then you realize, as your grandmother said, you know, if you can count your five friends on your hand at the end of your mm -hmm. life, you're blessed. Right. So, um, but I have a lot of significant friends and both male and female. And so, um, um, you know, it's, it's through, through guiding light and through other things. Um, I'm very close to my family in Minnesota, but all of this happened just not by osmosis. It happened by the fact that, you know, when I got defeated by alcohol, I mean, I could have lived the rest of my life in that sort of malaise of narcissism and self-importance and all the other things, you know, it's, it's um, Guideline was a blessing to me, but it wasn't a blessing to my recovery mm -hmm. because it, it, it propped up a fake persona of who I thought I was. And, um, 
I was, I, I believe I always was nice to people, but I was living in Minnesota myopic land. You know, yeah. I thought this is the way it's always, I was so far removed from reality. Um, well, as great as, you know, getting what was, you also, you know, got that sort of fame of soap at a young age too. Yeah, I did. I got the show, you know, pretty much right out of college. And, uh, um, you know, I, I kept all my boxes when I came to New York City because I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm not ready for this. I have no <laughs> idea what I'm doing. You know, and then I jumped in an acting class and I studied with uh, Bill, Bill Esper and I started to kind of learn what I was doing. But but the other thing, too, Alan, is that from the moment I stepped in this set with particularly with Grant Alexander, um, Grant welcomed me with open arms. And even though he's a year or two younger than me, Grant basically said, hold on to the back of my shirt and follow me. And that's the kind of man he is, a man of immense integrity. Um, and, you know, we just anytime he comes to New York City, we get together and we have some Mexican food and we sit in his pizza. You had the last time, I think. Yeah, we, some, we haven't been to we haven't been to John's Pizza in. <laughs> gosh, I don't know how 20 years. Crazy. And we met, we met at John's Pizza and it was where we used to we used to go when we were kids. Well, I love your casting story. Would you remind fans how you were cast as Dr. Rick? And and don't leave out the, the mom part, your mom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so um, I was an usher on The Price is Right. And, uh, Which is uh, a great, I mean, that's just a great, a great thing. thing. I was wearing my red suit and everything. And then I walk by and I see guiding light on, the, on this door. And I go, hey, what's going on there? And they said, there are auditions for guiding light. And I go, oh. So I go back to my room, get out of my red suit, put my street clothes on. Was it a polyester? Was it polyester? Oh, yeah. Correct? It's the worst polyester in the world. <laughs> um, and I knocked at the door and, and, and Betty Ray, our beloved uh, deceased, now deceased, a casting director was there. And I said, hey, my, my name is Michael Larry. And she goes, well, your name's not on the list. And I go, oh, well, I was supposed to buy. I, I conjured up some lie i'll just own it it was a lie and betty goes well let me just read you while you're here and so i, I read with her and she says you know something we're having a we're having a screen test with um 10 young ladies who are auditioning for the role of beth and mindy tomorrow can you be here and i said sure and i um i looked at the script and and it was like a romantic kissing scene with nine women and i'm thinking <laughs> yeah baby I'm getting <laughs> paid four hundred and fifty dollars to kiss nine women, and let me tell you, my dating life was not on fire at the time. I'm going, this is all right. So, <laughs> so I get there, and 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 you know, Judy Evans and Krista were amongst all these other beautiful, and I, you know, be kissing, and I say, "Oh, you were the best. And I, you were the best. No, you were the best." <laughs> and, and so I went through this whole thing, and I thought, and I had a ball. I was so relaxed, I had a ball, and I came home. At, after the audition and my mom is watching of all things the guiding light and so i i walk in and, and my mom's watching the show and and i'm making fun of it i'm ridiculed oh mom why are you wasting your time watching this nonsense this crud is it's nonsense and she says shh michael please don't say anything philip's got syphilis or gonorrhea or something and and and, and i'm just trying to i hope he's okay i hope he's okay and 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 the phone rings Rotary phones, folks. That's how long ago this was. <laughs> so I pick up the phone and I go, hello. And, and um, my agent says, Michael, you're not going to believe this, but um, they saw your, your screen test in New York with these young ladies. They love you. They're going to replace the guy who plays Rick Bauer. This was on a Wednesday. They want you there on Friday to shoot your first show. I hang up the phone and I look at my mother and I said, mom, you're not going to believe this. I, I'm I'm going to be playing that character. I'm I'm going to be Rick Bauer on the Guiding Light, and my mother goes, "Shh, Michael, I told you, Philip's got gonorrhea." <laughs> I am so upset. Mother, mother, did you hear me? She goes, "What?" what? I said, "I'm going to be on Guiding Light," and she just she went ballistic. She went, you know, she claims that um, that her water burst with me. <laughs> watching the show while she was bowling. She goes, my water bursts when I when I watch the show with you with the girls 
I was bowling and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that was on a Wednesday and on Friday, I mean, on Thursday, I flew to New York. I started the first day on Friday. Wow. I love that. So, And, and you know, you, you talk about your friendship with Grant, but Rick and Phillip's yeah. friendship was one of the most beloved pairings on the show. I mean, it's, you know, it's crazy. Well, um, Grant and I, man, it happened fast. I love him like a brother. I loved him from the moment, you know, we met. He... Um, he just took me in and, and we just had a great chemistry and, and Grant would always say, Mikey, um, the women are going to come and go in our lives, but we want to make sure that our friendship is maintained, that we still stay friends. I said, okay, all right, that's good. And they would do these breakup scenes. Like if I was having sex with, with Harley or if he was having sex with Abigail or whatever, we'd make sure that, that our makeup scenes were really, <laughs> really <laughs> fast. I mean, none of it was realistic. You know, this one time Grant was going, Rick, did you have sex with Harley? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I did. Why? Why would you do that? <laughs> uh, well, you were in a sinus right. cell and, and I just thought you were dead. Okay. Okay, just don't let <laughs> just don't wow, let that, it You really sound like him right there. I'm telling you something, Rick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hmm. You know who you have to do for me? Mary what? Kay. <laughs> oh, Mary, I can't do Mary Kay. I, I, you know, Philip, you're wrong, Philip. You're wrong. Philip. <laughs> and, and, and then there was uh, 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 Billy. 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 Hey, hey, I'll do something, River. Hey, I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell Josh, come in here. And he, he told me one thing. I'll tell you, River, you better more dates than a girl that. Amazing. Amazing. All right. So if I say name your wives, go. Can you? Oh, gosh. Um, Meredith, um, Beth, Mindy, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Mel, um, uh, um, uh, I'm at five. You're forgetting. You're one of the most favorites. Uh, Abby. Yeah, exactly. Abby. Yeah. Oh boy. That was, that was, that was a rough one too. Um, they didn't last. None of them lasted very none long. None of them lasted long. You know, Alan, I'm a doctor and all my wives were cheating on me. What, what is wrong? With <laughs> you know, um, I got so much sympathy by the way, by folk, by the fans, they just couldn't understand why all my wives are cheating on me. I, I you and uh, Amy Eklund were fabulous together. And, and Ivana, I liked yeah, Doctor yeah. Mel and yeah, and you know, yeah. fans were writing that they loved you with Meredith as well. They loved. I loved all my leading ladies. They yeah, were, you you, they were you didn't work with a bad one. You didn't work with a no. bad one. Well, one of your sisters sent sent a note. Rebecca Budd said, "I'm so sad to miss out on this interview today. Mm. That man will always be very dear to me. During my time on Guiding Light." He made me laugh the entire time and really took me under his wing. He brought me to a great church in New York City and truly watched out for me. We recently reconnected and I was fortunate enough for him to share his play with me that he has written. What a gifted storyteller. I can't wait to see what he writes next, as I know he has more to say. Please give Michael my love. Uh, I wanted Rebecca to join today. Amy almost joined us today. Oh but my she's god! On a she's on a field trip with her uh, school, uh, oh. and she really was so bummed. She wanted to surprise your face today. Oh, oh well, darn! Because I would have been very happy with either one of those. <laughs> I know things. you. I know you would have. I know you would have. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you worked with incredible people when you started. Larry Gates, William Rory. Beverly McKinsey, but, you know, as, as somebody who was so young, what, you know, what stands out in your mind? There was just a, 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 a an old school reverence that they, they carry themselves with every single one of them. And you just re respected them such, and you wanted to please them. And, um, and they always availed themselves. There was no, no sense of um, 
you know, uh, uh, distance, ego. ego, anything. If you walked in the room and say, hey, I'm struggling with something, can you help me with something? Everyone availed themselves. Beverly did. Larry, Larry Gates did. Um, you know, Peter Simon. Um, can't believe, you know, uh, Peter, Peter um, is the most gentle, sweet man I've ever met. And I adore him. And he's a funny, funny man. And, and um, so we had all of these great actors around us that showed us the way. I mean, you, you know, you're 21, 22 years old and you have all these actors, a lot of these actors who have substantial film careers, who are now doing, who have theater background, who are doing soaps. And you go, wow, I, you, you get to learn from the best. You know, that's what we did. Did you watch all of them while you were there? Did you just soak it all in? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'd see Chris Bonneau and how steady and, and you know, you learn from every single one of them. And Chris would be had so much power and, and he was so still and, and he was so imposing. And um, and then, you know, um, then there was, you know, like with with Peter, I learned from Peter all the time. Peter was the most naturalistic available actor I've ever met. Um, and then Larry Gates was so facile and so, you know, uh, fun and he made it look easy. I mean, that, that with Jordan Clark and Larry Gates and, you know, uh, Beverly McKenzie, they made the difficult look easy. Yeah, and that's the thing I was like, I go, you look at the material and say, you know, listen, there are times the material's not really, you know, you struggle with it. And you see the pros do it, you know, and you go, wow, I want to I want to make it look that easy and, and compelling at the same time. Were you nervous in, with any of them? <sighs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was I was nervous with Jerry. I was nervous. Oh, really? with Jerry. I was. I was nervous with Jerry. You know, Jerry and our relationship started to build, you know, over the years, because um, when I first started working, I didn't know Jerry all that well. Yeah, yeah. But if I had a scene with Jerry and often, you know, Dr. Power, Dr. Rick, Jerry was a lawyer and often Rick was getting sued for malpractice. <laughs> so, so, you know, I killed 45 patients down there. You know, I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and uh, so I always learned from, from dad. <laughs> no, I oh, know he was not the doctor in the world. I wish I had a nickel for every time I said I wish I could stop the bleeding because I would be a millionaire. Um, <laughs> I, it's amazing. You know, was it 43? Yeah, it was 43. And I remember when I killed, I think Jenna was the last person I killed in a helicopter crash. And they came out with some cake or something commemorating. Somebody kept track of all the people that died under my care. So, hey, listen, they called me Dr. Kavorkin for a reason, you know. They did. Speaking of Jerry, I mean, you, you did get to work with him, you know, on his last role. Crystal sent me this picture. <laughs> from yeah. Venice right oh my gosh a, yeah. yeah you guys must have really basically peed your pants we did um, you know I, I, I remember you know calling Jerry and you know I, I think I was Bob and he was Jay and uh, and of course I'm wanting to know more Jerry had read the script and I had and I said Jerry, can you can you tell me about the characters? Can you can you give me some insight to the characters? And he goes, Mikey, they live together in a tool shed. That's the character. <laughs> I said, okay, I can run with that. I can run with that. So, uh, you know, uh, Crystal wrote some two very fun characters, and we we had a ball. I worked with um, uh, Jerry for three days, and um, we had so much fun. So funny. Um, one of the fans said, too bad Rick didn't stay with Claire Ramsey. I forgot you and your dad slept with Claire Ramsey. Well, Claire broke Rick's virginity for those keeping score. Um, yeah, she was did the you first. Know that? I, was I first. think I remember that. I do yeah. remember that. I think, um, who walked in on that? Um, somebody walked in on that. Was it Abigail? Was it in the hospital too? No, Abby, was no. it? No, it wasn't Was Abby. it in the hospital? When we, when she broke my virginity? Yeah. Were you like in? No, I got I got class out. It was in a bedroom. 
<laughs> Susan was a I great. Don't do those things. I don't do those things at work. <laughs> Susan was great. So, Wasn't what's that? Susan was great. Oh, she, she was great. She was she sassy. Was a, yeah, she was a great character. Yeah, I mean, that really period sad. of time, that period of time, there was some great. You know, uh, another Odalian asked, you know, what was it like for you to really become the patriarch of the Bauer family? Wow, that's a very, very good question. I, I remember there was a point where I realized I was the last Bauer in the room. That was pretty profound. Um, Especially you know, because um, you had the opportunity to work with Sharita. Yeah. You know, Alan, I got to address something because it's sort of the inequity in the business that sometimes youth is served uh, in, in TV and people who are senior are not served. And I think the only reason I was standing is, is I was the youngest person in the room. And I, I did feel like the most talented person, Peter Simon was, was gone and I was still standing. And, you know, I, I, I have to give myself credit. I go, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't seem fair that he's not here and I'm here. So I feel like I inherited something that I didn't deserve. Now, great, mind you, I was very grateful to have a job, <clears throat> but I think that some of the inequities we think of in life and in, in this business in particular, that um, sometimes when you get to be a certain age, you become disposable. And there were a lot of people of a certain age that left and all of a sudden we became like, we became, I don't know, like the you know, romper room. We came with a lot of young people and all of the people that were above us were gone. And so the, the, the generational delineation that makes soap so compelling is no longer exists. So yeah, I became the senior bower at whatever I was, 45 or 50 years old, whatever it, it was. You know, I, it's hard to explain it. You know, the powers that be didn't fully grasp what we all loved, which was the generations of those families. Well, I remember, you know, you know uh, doing scenes with Sharita Bauer and, and the reverence I had for that and saying, wow, how cool I have a grandma, you know, a real grandmother, by the way, real spectacular woman. Uh, I want to tell a real quick story. So the first, Please. second day, the second day, the, the week after my, 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 my start, <clears throat> we were out, we went to Pennsylvania for a Quentin and Nola's wedding. And we're shooting at this country church out in the middle somewhere. I don't know where it was. And I was so nervous. I'm still nervous. And Sharita was sitting in this church uh, in the front row, second row. It was empty. There was no one in it. And she was reading the New York Times. And I was just standing there kind of looking around. I was so lost. And Sharita looks back and goes, Michael, come here. She knew my name. Actually, you know, I, I never met her. She knew my name. So I walk around. She pats the pew and she says, sit down. And I sit down. She goes, <clears throat> I want you to know that you're part of the family now. And if there's anything that you need, you come to me. No one is going to mess with you. Wow. And I said, okay. And she gives me a little hug and a smile. And that was it. And that's when I knew I belonged. Was <clears throat> when she welcomed me in that way. I really say it's, it's incredible, you know, how um, coming into an environment like that, having that happen is so important because we know that the, it doesn't always happen in, in work environments, in different, whatever it is, acting, whatever your, your field is, people don't always welcome other people, but it, it has a lasting impression on you. Well, Guiding Light, by and large, was never an individual sport. It was a community. It was an ensemble. And that's what made us so good because we were a true ensemble. I mean, what happened to Designing Women when one of the women left and wanted more money? It, everything fell apart. You know, we were the collective whole. We knew that the collective whole was better than the individual. And I think we always kind of understood that no matter what leadership came around, um, thank God our writers knew that. And we had that, we had it until we didn't have it. And when, when the, the ratings started to decline, <clears throat> I think the network started trying some things, I, I think to the detriment of our show, and they didn't trust what was there. <clears throat> and uh, there was a slow disintegration, I think. 
It's true. It's true. <clears throat> Do you miss it? <clears throat> um. Do you know, I don't, uh, I, I, boy, I think I put it, I put it behind me. I mean, mm -hmm. as far as the show is concerned, but what I do miss is like when I see Mark Derwin or people that I haven't seen, Rick Hurst has just come back in my life. You know, it's the relationships, you know, Jill Laurie and Grant and Ron and, and Peter Simon, Jay Hammer, you know, um, we still stay in touch. In fact, as we spoke right before the show started, yeah. there's, um, for those who don't know, the men to this day get together three or four times a year in New York City and we have dinner together. So in some ways, I don't feel like I've, it's behind me. It's, it's right here in front of me. You know, all those, all those great, you know, we, we, we make it a point to stay in touch. And Bruce Berry, I got to make sure Bruce is our director and he's our headmaster. He's the one who organizes these things. He's the maestro, you know, which a director is, yeah. right? Exactly right. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, are, are you still doing the um, organized crime here and there? Yeah, I have some dates coming up. Oh, um, great. Yeah, so um, I've been told <laughs> get, I'll be working your, with Christmas. Wash your collar. <laughs> You got to rush the blood off my doctor's outfit. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> got to get rid of the blood yeah. first. Got to get the yeah, wash that blood you know off of me. Um, yeah, it's um, they built the role that I'm going to be a sort of a confidant for somebody for Chris Maloney's character, and I think that's some stuff that's coming up soon. We just got a phone call about it recently. That's funny. When uh, a fan, Wendy, just said Alan needs to go to that dinner. Well. Wendy, I am. They have invited me this year, so I'm very excited to to be joining uh, that dinner. Um, it, it it yeah. Um, I love the story about you and Amy learning sign language. <laughs> can I tell? I can't tell that story on the air. You, you, you can. You know, this isn't network TV. <laughs> can I really? Oh my God! I I I. I it's so. It's so funny, but so inappropriate. Inappropriate. You were signing the wrong things, huh? Yeah, I was signing the wrong things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, really the wrong things. I mean, actually, Amy was, and I was copying what she was doing. And, whew, did we get in trouble. You know, it's so interesting, too. You know, uh, going back to Sharita and how we told socially relevant stories back then with her with her right. pap smear test. And then you move forward 40 years or whatever it was, and Amy's cochlear implant. Right. Yeah. That was, that was a really powerful um, story. You know, um, I learned sign language um, with Amy. Amy ironically did not know sign language because she read lips. There's a, um, I'm, I'm not going to pretend I understand the whole, whole deaf community, but there's, a segment that believes that you read lips and there's a segment that plays in, in sign language. She so, was beyond incredible at reading. Lips. Yeah. Amy Eklund is one of the most talented actresses I've ever worked with. And one of the sweet, kind, you know, people. Um, she, um, you imagine being deaf and being on a, on a soap opera set. So that was a bit of a challenge for her, but she made it through. And boy, I mean, like you, she really had an incredible sense of humor. Yeah, I mean, she's playing a deaf Amish virgin, and <laughs> you know, she Amy was kind of out there, you know. Oh, right. <laughs> so, oh, she was definitely out there. Oh, right. I forgot. Reva yeah. found Reva she, found her in the Amish yeah. country. Yeah. You know, when they came to me, um, I think it was Michael Lace, the producer, came to me. Says, Mike, we got this incredible, sexy story. And I said, Oh my gosh, what is it? You're going to fall in love, love with a deaf Amish virgin. It definitely wasn't Michael, I don't think, because I don't think I worked oh. with Michael. Jill oh. will tell us. Yeah, she'll, she'll, she'll correct it, me. It might have been Roush. Could have been Roush. Yeah, it might have been. And I said, well, okay, you know, what, what's the caveat to this? Is we have to learn sign language in two weeks. So a sign language teacher came to my house to teach me sign language. <laughs> and... Um, and so we had our first scene in the hospital. I'll, I'll, I'll get up to, I can't tell the story because it's so. It, but it's bad, but that's okay. 
everyone, you know, everyone knows you and they can imagine Amy yeah. to Amy to, you know, it's it's the I, mean, I, I can tell you that it's the hardest anybody ever laughs at any of my stories. <laughs> They laugh at this one the hardest. And you know who laughs well, really Jill, hard? Well, Jill wrote LOL, Mikey signing. So she must yeah. know. She must yeah, know she knows it. And and Amy is a good sport about it because I do her an imitation of her voice when, you know, because we're a little bit high. And she's a good sport about it, you know. <laughs> uh, one of the fans said he looks like he, he had been signing his whole life. Um, yeah, everybody loved Rick and Abby. But I forgot they said you cheated on. I can't remember everything. Who do I, I didn't cheat on Abby, did I? Somebody said you cheated on Abby. You might have. I know that's well, the thing. I can't remember you know, everything. Could have been Philip. It could have been Philip because he, he could have come over, borrow the vacuum cleaner, and <laughs> Abby. You know, it's like, hey, Rick, I just got to borrow the vacuum cleaner, and I said, oh, I'm going to go out and get some milk, and then I come back, and you know, it stuff happens. Oh, Mikey, it's so good to see you. Congratulations on Halloween ends. I hope everyone goes out and sees it this weekend. And keep us up to date on Breathing Under Dirt so we can let everybody know. I sure will. We're aiming for Black History Month in February in Macon, Georgia. Um, three evenings That's of stage smart. reading. So, um, you know, work to be done, but we're, we're getting close. And so I'll keep everybody apprised. That's awesome. Mikey, you stay well, yeah. my friend. I'll see you in November. <laughs> thank you, Alan. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Like I said, thank you, Michael O'Leary for joining and for your honesty and please go see Michael in Halloween ends in theaters now or streaming on Peacock. Join me tomorrow to meet up and coming actress Dylan Ratzliff, who has the lead role in lifetimes speaking of Amish and Amish sin. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel down below and turn on notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. If you'd like to stream audio versions, just search The Locker Room on your favorite streaming platform. Have a great evening, everyone, and I will see you tomorrow.